Should I just launch? Yeah, it? absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Launch. <laughs> Uh, well, hello there. Um, some of you may recognize me. I'm Jean Walsh with the SFPUC. How many of you uh, were in this room in November when we had a meeting here last year? Right? And uh, tonight we don't have Harlan and, and the big dogs. It's just me and Amy here. But um, we think we'll do a good job of, of communicating our messages and getting your feedback. Uh, we're with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, um, a.k.a. the Water Department. And uh, we are here to talk with you about some of the progress we've made on our sewer system improvement program and the capital project that we're planning for the area. And also to just uh, talk with you about some of the issues we're grappling with as an agency and to get your feedback. So we have comment cards on the tables that you can see um, that we would ask everyone to fill out. We really want to hear from you and we're going to wrap all this information up and provide it to our management so they can make some really tough decisions. Um, we're doing this sort of little road show, we call it, at a number of community groups around town. Uh, so. Uh, let's see here. Why don't we get started? So the PUC, you must know who we are, but I'll just say it just in case. Uh, we are the water department. Uh, we deliver water to 2.6 million people in the Bay Area. And we also, in the course of delivering that water, we generate uh, hydropower, and that is used to power uh, buildings like this one, schools, libraries, Muni, the airport, and our new program called Clean Power SF. Uh, we use that power to power residents. Instead of PG&E power, it's Hetch Hetchy power. So that's an exciting new initiative that our agency is undertaking. And finally, we also manage the sewer system. So a uh, little bit about the sewer system. I bet most people in the room know how it works, but for those of you who don't, we have um, a combined sewer system, which means that we not only treat when you flush your toilet, take a shower, uh, run your dishwasher, we treat all that. That's the easy part. The hard part is we also treat all the rain that falls on the city streets. It's called a combined system because all that water is combined into our pipes goes to our treatment plants for full, full, full treatment. Uh, so that's a little bit about our system. We have 25,000 catch basins. Those are the semi-circular grids you see on the corners that sometimes get clogged with leaves. We're asking people to adopt a drain and help us sweep those leaves away so that that water can drain properly. We'll talk a little bit more about that problem later, or excuse me, project later. Uh, so we're dealing with a lot of uh, issues here in, in our sewer system. One of them is seismic reliability. Here we are on the anniversary of Anybody know? Loma 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 Korea, right? We're in a lot better shape than we were in 1989, but we still have to make sure that our system is seismically reliable. Um, we also have aging infrastructure. 30% of our pipes in the streets were put in in the gold rush times. So we have old pipes that really need to be upgraded. Uh, one of the big pieces of our sewer system improvement program, which is the $6.9 billion program to upgrade our sewer system, uh, one of the big pieces is to upgrade our, our wastewater treatment plant in the Bayview. Has anybody taken a tour of our treatment plant? Yay! So we give tours on Saturdays of the treatment plant. I encourage you to take one. You can learn about all the work that goes on at, at our treatment plants and to treat our city's waste. Uh, so that plant is getting a major upgrade. Uh, that plant was built in the 50s with 40s, in, uh, excuse me, 40s technology. So it's really in need of a, of, a, of a facelift, more than a facelift, an overhaul. And that's what we're doing at, at our Southeast Treatment Plant. Um, and so again, we have you know, seismic reliability is a challenge. We have odor issues. If you talk to anybody that lives in the Bayview at one, near one of those plants, they say, when are you going to fix this plant? We're tired of smelling sewer odors. You know, we have flooding and stormwater management issues. Uh, we have aging infrastructure. We have climate change, sea level rise. Uh, we're looking at a lot of different issues that we're trying to address in our sewer system improvement program. Um, so we, about uh, 2002, we launched the water system improvement program, and that was another massive infrastructure uh, upgrade. That was a $4.8 billion, $4 billion program to upgrade our water system. And we're winding down, we've done almost 90 projects, we're winding down and, and nearing completion of that program, and now we're turning our eyes to the sewer system. So we've started that program, goodbye, and, uh, and we're, we're in, moving forward with the sewer system improvement program, and as we do that, we're really having to prioritize how we spend our money and how we make our investments. And that's what we're here to talk with you tonight about. And at that point, I will turn it over to Amy Cam. She is a project manager that works on stormwater and flooding issues at the PUC. And she's going to talk some of the technical aspects with you. Thanks, Jean. So um, I know a lot of you have gotten a lot of background information on combined sewer and also how that combined sewer serves us during stormwater events. But I, um, I wanted to kind of frame stormwater management and flooding in 
flood protection within the context of all the other system-wide challenges that we're faced with dealing with as an agency. So um, flooding in San Francisco is kind of a challenging problem. We have, and that's mostly due to our unique topography. So if you look on this map here, you might have it in front of you as well if you can't see up here. Um, our, our city generally follows two different watersheds or basins, and that's divided along a general ridge that is more or less down the center. So on the west side, rainfall that falls eventually moves through the treatment plant and then discharges out to the Pacific Ocean. And then likewise, on the east side of our city, the flows from the, this entire side flows down to our treatment plant in the Bayview and then gets treated and then flows out to the bay. <coughs> and so what happens is, because we have all these hills, you can kind of see based on the shading on this map, what happens is when there's rainfall, the water goes from the higher elevations and it flows downhill based on gravity and goes towards the lower elevations. And so if we look on this map, this shows a little bit better uh, what we're talking about. So if we focus on the, on the east side of the city, you'll notice these light aqua shaded areas. So these areas designate low-lying areas in the city, so lower elevation areas that a lot of times coincided with our historic waterways, so historic creeks, marshes. I think we heard May talk about um, here in the Cayuga Ingleside area, this used to be uh, Isles Creek. And so even though we, those creeks are no longer flowing on the surface because we built over them with buildings and streets and pavement, water will still travel there because of gravity. That will always be the case. That's what nature will do. And so that's one of the main challenges of our city is to manage the water that flows down these hills to these low areas. And so you'll also see on this map these dark red shaded areas. Um, and it may be difficult to see from where you're sitting. Um, they are very small areas in comparison to the overall area of the city. It's about half a percent by area. Um, and even though it's a small area, um, when it does flood in those areas, we know that for the people who live there, such as maybe some of you or who operate businesses in these areas, it's a really, it's a big problem <coughs> because it can cause damage, it's very disruptive. And so we as an agency, uh, we see it as a very important um, issue to address and to try to improve conditions for flood protection in those areas. And so that's kind of what we're here to talk to you about. Um, so in terms of trying to improve these conditions, we have a number of initiatives underway. Um, in the short or immediate term, we have um, our wet weather operations that kick off every rainy season. And here in San Francisco, it's just started. It goes from October to April, so it's about six months. And um, as part of those short-term initiatives, um, we deploy uh, temporary flood barriers in the 17th and Wilson area in the mission, which has been identified as one of those flood-prone, low-lying areas. Um, and citywide, we also have our rapid response teams that are activated during the winter based on forecast weather. So based on anticipated rainfall events, we gear up um, additional staffing and crew to be at the ready for our emergency responses needed throughout the city. Um, in terms of midterm um, solutions that we're looking at, we've dedicated a quarter billion of dollars in investments towards uh, planning projects for some of these high priority areas that are um, shown in blue. Um, Cayuga happens to be one of them, and I just wanted to take the opportunity to give a brief update. So um, that project is still underway. We're in the process of finalizing our planning process. Um, and in the course of the planning, um, because it involves um, parcels that are that belong to Caltran, Caltrans. There's a necessary back and forth coordination and negotiation with them because we're trying to work with their property to provide a solution for the community. And so today was actually um, one of our second meetings with Caltrans. Um, it's part of the next step of the process in coordinating our efforts with them to get them on board with what we're trying to do with their parcel. So that's moving forward. Um, and we'll be happy to answer questions at the end if you have any other questions. Um, so that was the midterm, or the example of the midterm projects. In the long term, um, we just finished our flood resilience study, which was undertaken to give us a better understanding of the types of investments and in infrastructure that would be needed to achieve different levels of protection. So for example, um, in order to meet the level of service or the, the current flood protection standard that we have across the entire city and to kind of address these, these red areas that are currently flood prone, we would need to invest about $2 billion. And so 
we, in terms of an agency and how um, we're trying to prioritize how we invest our money and how we spend the money in terms of upgrading our system and updating our system to make sure it continues to function, we need to kind of balance costs, needs, and impacts to the city as a whole. And so comparing the flood protection with that $2 billion price tag, we could also look at something like the Southeast plant, which is a treatment plant upgrade that would affect 80% of the city and is critical to the proper functioning and making sure that we maintain public health. That is also about $2 billion. So it's these kinds of decisions that we're faced with. It's, it's a challenge, right? We have limited funding. We have lots of system needs. But we have to make these difficult decisions. And so I also wanted to point out that no matter how we decide to prioritize our investments and no matter how much we invest in our infrastructure, there just simply isn't a, a system that we can design that can possibly withstand all possible storms or all possible climate factors. So there's always going to be that larger storm that could come along that just is simply too big for our system. It's very similar to like earthquakes. Right? We pick a standard and if there's a bigger earthquake that comes, it may cause some damage. Um, that being said, um, there are things that we can take, like all of us can take uh, as individuals to try to safeguard ourselves against um, flood damage and flood risk. And so um, it really takes, because as I mentioned, we do have all these competing priorities and competing system needs and limited resources. It really takes a partnership between us as an agency and city and you as community members and property owners to make sure that we can safeguard our city as best as possible. And so something that we've undertaken as, um, as an agency is our Rain Ready SF program. Um, this is a program that's meant to provide you as residents, business owners, and property owners with the, ne the necessary information to protect yourselves in all your storms as best as possible. And so we have, um, I'm not sure if they've been passed out, but we have this information online on our website. And we also have flyers and brochures that summarize some of, um, some of the things that we can all do. Um, so in online or in the brochures that you can pick up and take home with you today, we got them. Yeah. yeah, they're they're back there. Um, yeah. You can read th about things like uh, low cost flood insurance. Um, you can also read about our flood water um, grant program, which is a program that you can take advantage of as a property owner to make upgrades to your property to decrease and protect yourself decrease your flood risk and protect yourself against larger storms um, by making improvements where you can be reimbursed up to $30,000. So we have application information uh, for you here today as well. Um, we also have our sandbag program where we distribute free sandbags to flood prone areas like Cayuga. Um, and then my personal favorite is the Adopt the Drain program that G mentioned where we're encouraging members of the community to become engaged and active in helping our maintenance crews and their, and their regular um, sweeps across the city for those 25,000 cash basins. And so what you can do is you can go online or you can download an app. You'll see a map of the city with all the catch basins. Um, you can claim a particular catch basin in your neighborhood, on your block, or in your community. You can name the catch basin, and then you would be responsible for uh, kind of monitoring the state of that catch basin. You could break leaves off the grate to make sure it functions properly, or you could just call 311 to report any problems. Um, and I'll give it back to Jean to kind of tell you a little bit more about how you can learn more about our system, the uh, SSIP. I see your hand. I'll I guess you. Um, and, uh, and also how you can become involved. And then most importantly, the reason we're here today is to get your feedback. So we'd like to, we'd like to hear from you about what priorities are the most important to you in terms of all the challenges that we're facing um, throughout the city for our system. So that could be seismic reliability, it could be treatment upgrades, stormwater and flood management. We just, we just want to hear from you. So yeah, thank you. And let's take some questions. Do you have anything new to tell us today? This sounds like exactly what you guys came here a year ago to say, we get sandbags, we get, we're working on it, we're taking your opinions. I've given my opinion to the SFPUC more times than I can count, and what do I get? Sandbags for my house. What are you guys doing? This feels like a box that you guys just come here to check off every so often to make sure that you know that you feel like you're taking care of us when you're not. What are you guys doing? We do want to make sure that we are getting out here and talking with people on a regular basis. So that's why we're coming out 
And that's why we send our emails. And make sure you're on our list so that you can get our periodic emails so that we can keep you updated as our plans progress. But I don't know if you caught what Amy was saying about the project that we're planning for the foot of Cayuga. Um, this is the same plan that you guys had last year. We get a retaining wall, which helps maybe some people, but not my house, not lots of other people in Mission Terrace. So I want to know what you guys are doing beyond putting a retaining wall at the end of Cayuga. Which, what else you got? the record, was a suggestion made by one of our residences mm -hmm. prior to this whole you know, uh, community outreach that you guys are doing. We have, and I've recorded every single meeting. It's, I could even print out the transcript. It's verbatim what you guys Well, I'll tell present. you what's new. What's new since last year is that we have completed this flood resilience study. <laughs> okay. And On it, top this of is all important the because okay. we can't decide to just spend billions of dollars without really evaluating. I'm sorry, but I'm only laughing, but how many times have you done flood resilience studies even before the 60s when the grant was originally, originally passed to fix the sewer system then? Again, it's, 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 it's the same recurring questions. I'm sorry, Eugene, yeah, but you, you already you know this. Spent, I don't know you know how, our email met, how much money Every, on study after study after study. Which you you understand what the problem is, but well, you then, don't fix it. Then I would encourage you to fill out the comment card. Oh my god, you guys have direct like contact information from every yeah. single one of our residences on Cayuga and the surrounding areas. <laughs> how many times do I have to go through this dog and pony show to make you guys feel like you're doing your jobs? Because you're not. Because we're stuck with it as, as homeowners. We live with this every single day for the past m more than a decade. Okay, so Do you, you even live here? Else besides studies? I don't live in Cayuga. I live in San Francisco. Okay. Yeah. But you're not affected directly. So I live in personally, Cayuga. you don't have, you have not been enthralled in this nightmare. I understand. For the funny. entire more than 10 decades. Okay. Nice that you understand and you're sympathetic. So but I you're really, Hays, it's really funny. Which is actually so, somewhat similar. Hayes Valley it. does not get flooded to, set, to the, the same okay. extent that we have been. I recognize Thank you. that. I recognize can, that. And that's true. It's can, true. Can, can, can I maybe can, can, yeah, please try finish. to respond? So, part of what makes the flood resilience study different and unique from other studies mm. is that it is intended to provide. Um, it's supposed to quantify different options for investment, right? So and once you finalize, have a recommendation, will you put it on the docket and actually take it out after so, so many revisions? So the, is that the, the same drill? The flood resilience study is going to inform our larger system-wide um, recommendation for ranking projects and coming up with a system-wide, city-wide list of projects that are critical. That are identified. That, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. We've heard that okay. before, yes. But this is before flood resilience was done. So flood resilience specifically incorporates stormwater management with respect to flood protection into that citywide program. Okay, can you give us a timeline, so uh, like a is, realistic timeline right, of so what that, it will take so to help of, us? Yeah, instead of six like, months. Because every year, every meeting. every six months or every nine months or once a year, you guys. No, we do. This we out, do have a timeline. So, so that recommendation yeah. for the citywide, system-wide ranking of, of recommended projects. That's due next year, in the first half So of it'll be year. three years after the actual flooding incident. Three years after the actual incident, you'll actually have a plan to move forward for another 20 year of actual construction and so fixing the sewer system so that has been identified for more than a century. So as we've mentioned, it's because system needs change throughout time, right? Conditions change. There's different things at play, funding changes. And so it's an adaptive, it is, it's an adaptive yeah, management. Yeah, I mean, thinking, of, thinking of managing your household, right, sometimes things change, right? You have, something will break. I know, we had budget for this in yeah. what, the 2010 SSIP? Let me, let me get Mark too busy and too. got the funding taken away. So that we, is what we actually have paid attention to your SSIP plans over the years. And your public reports. So, so can we take, I mean, I don't know if we're going to be able to make you happy tonight. I have a You won't until you yeah. fix the sewer. <laughs> There's basically several neighborhoods on this side of town that have suffered. And, uh, and it's suffered, in my opinion, because the water won't remain in the sewers. It backs up. So if you go down to Alamany and Folsom, they catch it before it backs up, up this way. They're the first where the sewer head pops. You also get problems down in Ingleside Terrace, off of Victoria, um, near Ocean, Victoria yes, yeah. and uh, Urbana. 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 Yeah. You also have a problem down at 15th 
and Vicente, 15th and Wawona. Correct. Yes. Now down there they suffered because PUC, fresh water, they had a water main burst. And then, what is it, a year later, they had their problems December two years ago. How much are you going to spend to fix 15th and Wawona? So, 15th and Wawona, I believe, I have to look. I think it is, I don't want to, I need to fact check myself. The range is 10 to $20 million. That's the range. I don't know exactly. Let's say, let's say $20 million because things happen. So that's How much are you willing to spend on Cayuga? So Cayuga <laughs> is a is a larger problem. Um, it's different than what one one has a smaller watershed draining to it. So topography and size both play into the extent and magnitude of the problem. And so for for Cayuga, which is around here, it's actually upstream of where um, the worst case is. So downstream. Right or around, yeah, Bayshore and Alameda around there. Right. So in this area, <clears throat> the flooding problem is the most exacerbated of the entire Cayuga, this watershed that affects right. Cayuga. And so in order to alleviate the Cayuga situation, uh -huh. there were several other larger scale, longer term options. Wait right? So that's part of what's going to be in the citywide program. How much money? That, I believe it's quoted, depending on one, because we haven't done like exact design, it's going to range from 40 to 70 million. So, day. do you plan to hook up with the College Hill Tunnel where the outlet is underneath the Mission Viaduct? So, it did, we haven't designed all of that, and I'm not involved on that project personally. No, are you so familiar with it? I am familiar with it. I don't know what option will be picked, but the general the general concept is to expand the capacity of Alamany, the main Alamany um, collector. So that could be a, through a number of ways. It could be with an auxiliary. It could be connecting to like a diversion. But so this comes up. It is uh, what was it? Gavin was Gavin was mayor. So I guess it happened 2004, uh, the the time before. Or at least I think he was mayor because he was down there with Gerardo Sandoval, um, looking at the flood zone. This is the one over 10 years ago. And so now we've had this repeat. The two repeats in December, two years ago. People have seen this, and they have ideas that you knock out that berm of earth at the end of Cayuga, that you figure out some way, if it comes to the surface, that it gets down to the College Hill Tunnel, which exists and could take the water north towards, you'd store it somewhere, you'd keep it moving somewhere until you had the capacity to make it happen. Right, so we, so the thing with, it's a balance of timing, right? Timing resources and impact. And I'm, and I'm speaking, assuming that there's funding available. So the current project that we're looking at for Caillou, if you're right, it does not solve everybody's problem. It is a short term or shorter term smaller scale project because it's what's most readily available. So there's that parcel that we could potentially leverage from Caltrans in order to do exactly that, detain and alleviate surface flooding and surface waters until which time the system downstream has capacity to receive it. So that would somewhat alleviate, it would cut down the flood depth by about half, but it's not gonna make it go away, and it's not gonna make it go away for everyone upstream either. Well, I had, I had a question about that. While Wona, as I understand it, you have basically the combined sewer system at 15th and Wild Wona. Mm -hmm. If I understood it correctly, one of the options was to have a separate storm Correct. drain yes. that would lead down into the, the, you know, the Christian yeah. science that whatever they call that thing, and so yeah, you exactly. would be so you would be accommodating them with a storm system at that at that one location because it's feasible or somewhat feasible. So the thing to consider with this area is you can imagine with a freeway, there's a lot more congestion in terms of existing infrastructure. Not only is there the freeway, but there is the Mission Overpass. And so that burn that you're speaking of is actually somewhat to protect the abutment structurally for the roadway above. So for on the surface, there's things, there's a lot of great ideas out there, but when you dive deeper, there are, there are limiting factors, right? So that's, that's part of why there has to be studies, because 
there's other critical infrastructure in the area that we have to accommodate. Let's take you and then you. Well, can Caltrans be more involved then? Because, so we're trying to. Because, because that yeah. is the cause of the problem, that construction of the freeway, which chopped up the so neighborhood, that's, that's created the problem. Yeah, and you're right. And so that's something that we're engaging with them now, like they're actively speaking with them and <coughs> trying to get to some agreement. Two major a, um, yeah. agencies, you know, it's hard to coordinate, yeah. you can imagine, the different regulatory bodies and mm -hmm. governing bodies, so but we are yeah. engaging and in discussions And they're trying to sidestep it, I'm sure. Yes. And that, but, but it's a, a systemic effect because it, it connects to Folsom and Alamany, it floods under the interchange of all the right. freeways right. 101 and 2. So, you know, yeah. how could we force them to step up, you know, and uh, do their part? So I, I mean, we can speak. We can speak with you more about that. We'd love to see how you guys would want to be involved. But we're trying to take their pulse right now too to see how amenable they are to what we're trying to propose. So uh -huh. yeah, these are all the things that we're. But also we can't act unilaterally on their property, right. and you know, we right. do need their participation and cooperation. And right, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they have to step up. <laughs> Yeah, David mentioned in 2004 there was another flood, and I do remember that distinctly. And I remember the PC coming out saying, yeah, yeah, we know what the problem is downstream. We're going to take care of it. We've got money and a project. And I'm wondering what happened to that project and what happened to that money? I don't remember, did, I don't remember that we ever said we had money and a project. I mean, yeah. It, yeah, but you stood out right in front it. of our neighborhood the same way that at least stood in front of us in the, in the town hall meeting and said, yes, we do have funding and we're going to fix this back in 2004. And so now you understand why I'm very passionate about mm -hmm. this. Because when two mayors talk to the constituents face to face right. and on record says, say right. what they're going to say and not follow through 10 years later, 12 years later, and it's still the same thing being studied and studied yeah. and studied. How do you think your citizens are right. going to Well, feel? and we're delivering a hard message here because we're not promising that we're going to fix the problem. We are not standing up here saying, we got it taken care of. We're saying, we're saying we are going to do a project that's going to alleviate flooding for some people in some storms. And Until the next major one. <laughs> like, you know, at we are looking at longer term solutions. Like They're very, very costly. And we don't know how our commission and our governing bodies are going to evaluate and decide. That's where we are. It, it's not a, it's not. I'm not sure who between the two of Why don't you guys go? <laughs> Why don't you go sure. first? Okay. Um, I have a question. Our house is being about to become remodeled and we have a, a drain like we're looking I'm looking at this picture number five and right now goes down the side of the house it doesn't right now if the gutters do not catch all the rainwater the water goes in it comes out and it goes right across our driveway out into the street now I was told that to be under code you know correct with the code that downspout should be tied into the sewer but isn't that making it you know, that's just adding to everyone else's grief. We're a little upstream of, of this, the flooding. Area. So I would like to make my house as, as conserve, conserve the water as much as possible. And I see the cistern. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the existing code? So that when we do remodel this, change the house, put in new gutters, we can have it directed into a cistern or into something else so to keep all that additional rainwater out of the sewer system altogether. If I was told it had to be tied into the sewer. It does not have to be tied into the sewer. There okay. is an option for you to install a rain barrel. Um, it's not mandated to uh, install a rain barrel, but if you would choose to do that, we actually okay. we do have a grant program for that. And that well. would be considered code. Or <laughs> yes. They, would they amended the code. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. The code was amended. Right. And that, you know, I think you would find that that barrel would fill up really fast. I uh know. -huh. You know, but we, you know, that is that is something that people can do, and that we do have a program for that. Okay. And then you were going to go? Yeah, so I, I don't see too well, but I'm not here. Like, can you go straight? Is it considered like a floating zone, like officially? Is there an official map where you can see where are the zones San Francisco that are actually considered officially? Zone. For what I see, this is like marsh, right. tide marsh. It's not so, floating zone. It's so just okay. It's a right. zone that can be. But uh, is there a map where it says actually okay, those are floating zones, 
Because Cayuga was not a marsh or whatever, it's the problem came because the way the construction was done. So it's not a flooding zone, it's just that it's flooded because there's a problem with the infrastructure, right? Well, it actually but did used to follow, so this is a historic creek here. Right. But, so it but, did used to go through Cayuga. Right, but is, but there, is there somewhere a map or some sort of official you know, area that so considers that the floating zone, yes or not? No. So no. The, so so the city doesn't have I, any area no, she'll where tell you floating zone. Can I, can I just answer your question? <laughs> so generally speaking, the body that designates flood zones is FEMA, FEMA. for the whole country. Um, <coughs> FEMA, the way they define flood zones is surface water, right? So <coughs> San Francisco doesn't currently have any rivers, but that's generally what would be used to designate floodplains anywhere else in the country, rather than Mississippi or what, what have you. So we don't have those. So there are, according to FEMA, there are no official flood zones in San Francisco. So you can build However, anywhere, even like even though you know so there's going to be flooding at some point, you can build. Like there's no I don't, code that says don't build here, for example. Because so there's I don't be know. Flooding at some point. No, that's a, that's a San Francisco planning question. I'm I unfortunately am not part of as of planning. Uh, I don't know if we have any regulations towards that, but I do know that the city as a whole, and especially in terms of climate change. We're definitely collectively across agencies looking at that. So I would I would say that, that it's on the radar, but as of now, there's no official map. So and so there's, there are no floating zones in San Francisco, like official. No, where, correct. You know, not, there's not some money that can be put by a city not, or somewhere not to actually to, to, to fix this problem. Because right. if there's not somewhere a map that says this is actually floating zone considered like uh, you know officially floating zone. Why? That actually works in your benefit because FEMA doesn't have a flood map for San Francisco. It's not considered a flooding zone. That's why flood insurance is so flood. cheap. But it does because flood. it's not so considered a flooding it area. Not flood. But it does flood. You see it. So it doesn't make sense. You know, I don't see why it would be at our advantage. It's just to the advantage of getting flood insurance. But yeah, FEMA is the agency that... that well, but creates the flood, flood anyway. So I mean, it's not because you have an insurance that you're happy because you're you know you have an insurance because right. you've been flooded. That doesn't make sense anyway. So fine, welcome. Two folks there. Uh, I'm wondering what aquifers might be available uh, in in this watershed uh, that could be used to absorb excess water rather than just as runoff into the bay. So the thing that's not actually it kind of is to show. So if you see here, this is, this. it's very difficult to see, I apologize. It's this dotted dark blue line here, shows the extents of the natural shoreline on the east side. And so what you see is, this is all fill, and there's actually pockets of fill throughout the city too, um, which makes aquifer recharge a little bit more complicated because you have contaminants and leaching and things like that to worry about. The west side has a little more opportunity, so, for groundwater recharge, um, and that's mostly a function of its its geology. So the most of the west side is sandbar. So this used to be beach historically, and so it makes it a lot more amenable to like percolation and natural filtration when you recharge the groundwater. So there are there are studies and plans to <coughs> access and leverage those resources on the west side. But this side it's <coughs> mostly me. serpentine, and that's a very fractured kind of rock, you would think, you know, that it could penetrate in a lot of places. Uh, so it's also, I mean, I don't know the specifics of our area on the, on the east side, but you, taking into account groundwater level would also be groundwater level and just structural integrity of all this area that's pretty highly developed. So it's, it's fairly complicated, but in terms of the feasibility of what we're proposing, the west side is, mu is much more, uh, there's much more potential on the west side. Has any consideration been given to buying out the 10 or 20 or 30 houses at the end of Cayuga um, and turning it into a park? I don't know how seriously, I mean, the, the idea has been raised. Um, well, you're talking about spending $60 million. Mm -hmm. That would buy out a lot of houses. But that's also, I mean, it's, you can't unilaterally decide to do that either. Well, but so. it's, it's an option. It's an idea sure. that's come up. Yeah, it's come up. It has it's it's come up. up. And have you considered Well, we've evaluated it, yes. In terms of like an economic yeah. comparison. Yeah, right. benefit-cost ratio right. is an op right. option and it has sure. certain benefits. 
I, I had a question. If you try to solve the problem on the first several blocks of Cayuga, when you say, I'm sorry, first several blocks you're talking about? I'm talking about the north end. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the lowered number up to, say, the up through the 600 block minimum, up all the way up to Santa Rosa. If you try to solve the problem when the water is there, you're in a bind. If you can find a way to solve incrementally part of the problem further upstream, you can get more bang for your buck. That's, that's one thought. Mm -hmm. So Rosie Jenks, who works for you guys, does a nice presentation. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like to say I'd like more of the core presentation that she gives as opposed to the long introduction about the PUC. We're all familiar with the PUC. But if I, as I understand her presentation, if you have cisterns, if you have rain barrels, mm -hmm. if to take some of the precipitation that falls on the roof, mm -hmm. if you take away some of the concrete so that there's less of a flow into the street, if the city planning department again, if they decided that if you want to take out a permit for your house, you have to restore the permeability other than the pathway and the driveway. So I think I know where you're going with this. Yeah, what I'm saying is is that if the water gets down there all the quicker, and the, and, it, and the pipes up above upstream have been improved, and the question is you still have them going on to the same course. So when you have an event, you have more water getting there quicker. Right. So to address green infrastructure in general, and the concept of removing the rainfall from even entering the system. So you're right, it does, the key things to focus on are that it would be very incremental. So time, if we're talking about, oh, another three years, right? So trying to implement the, the extent of green infrastructure in order to effectively mitigate the flooding downstream, you would have to implement a lot of green infrastructure. Yes. And furthermore, those infrastructure improvements would large part be dependent on private property, which introduces a, you know, a lot more, like the implementation mechanism is highly complicated there. Like we can't compel, it's much more difficult to compel. <laughs> it's easier said than done, but you can't just force pro private property owners to make changes to their property. Um, also green infrastructure is more expensive um, in terms of capital costs than a, a traditional alternative. And so those are, I, I would say, the three main takeaways for, for considering, oh, well, wouldn't green infrastructure help? The answer is yes. The short answer is yes. The longer answer is much more complicated. It's not as, not as much as I might like, but still, yeah. it has to be uh, less of a hassle for PUC than having people drive down to Chavez to line up for Same sandbags. Yeah. Yeah. And every time, every time you see the homes in the neighborhood, they're still maintaining them on the side of the driveway. Every time you see sandbags, in my feeling, it's a failure on the part of the city to provide an honest solution. So this is something that I'd, I'd want you to say is every single person who has to go through this, whether it's over in Ingleside Terrace, whether it's Guabona, whether it's 17th and Folsom, whether it's the other locations, once they start talking to one another, and they compare it, they're, they're not likely to be as sympathetic to the structural administrative issues that are in the PUC. And it's been two years. This round. And also, every time we do have predictions of large storms coming, the media jumps all over PUC putting in those plastic barriers to keep the floodwaters back at 17th and Folsom. And it makes me ill to think that my neighbors here in Cayuga have that same suffering. And yet there's no media, there's no mention of putting up any barriers. It's all down at 17th and Folsom because, oh my God, those poor people are getting flooded out. It's happening all over, you know. Let's spread the attention to our end of town. Well, you had a reporter here tonight because yeah. we called them. Yeah. Because no, we, we, we called piloted them. that. Yeah, we, we piloted yeah. that um, flood barrier uh, project at 17th yeah. and Folsom last year, and we wanted to see does it work. You know, how do we implement this? How many resources does it take to have guys on scene to let people in and out of their driveways? You know, we wanted to make sure that it actually was effective. 
And so we piloted that last year, and we'll be piloting in this year, and we're still evaluating if that's something that we can roll out on a larger basis. So it's not over yet. Did you see? No. We had our own... Uh, so we have about five more minutes before we have to go. Um, so we'll take a couple more questions. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I think what David said is pretty much a no-brainer about incentivizing the better rainwater management in the city, and I'd like to see that get on it. So we do have a, a number of programs. I mean, in terms of new new developments or significant redevelopment of an existing property, we have our stormwater management ordinance, which is meant to help manage the creation of impervious area. So you're, you're required as a developer or a property owner to make sure that you restore existing pre, pre-construction, whatever it is that you're proposing, that you're not making it worse. That's a start, but I'd like to yeah. see you incentivize people to take out the concrete, to do the rainwater. So rain. that's also part of the, that's part of our, that system-wide uh, recommend, recommended plan that is coming out next year. Incentive programs have been looked at at that uh, as part of. The <coughs> well, I'd just like to say I'd like to see you guys. Okay, yeah, do you have a voter incentivizing? Yes. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. And we have a few more here. Why don't you go first, and then you? Maybe okay. these are the last three. Following on Martha's mm -hmm. suggestion, the idea would be probably should take part take place in two parts. One is to give people incentives to positively remove the concrete without, mm -hmm. you know. You know, induce them say, hey, you know, we'll haul away the broken concrete, mm -hmm. you can use whatever greenscape you want, so you have groundwater penetration instead of having it all go into the storm drains. The other half of this is that you can give them a bit of a stick. You have the carrot is paying or, you know, a neutral cost neutral to the homeowner. The stick is that you assess all the properties in San Francisco because we know you go all the way out to the sunset and there's no grass everybody's yard is paved over and their front yards are parking lots and it's very much happening here in this side of the slope as well eventually you start to incrementally increase people's water rates based on you know that program too. <laughs> based on the fact that they are not removing the concrete right. yes. so you say okay your neighbor is paying less because they remove their concrete. You're paying more, and then right. you, you just gerrymander so, it a little bit. So that, that's also being considered. Okay. But again, all these are great ideas. It's just the, imp the implementation. There are lots of regulations and laws and ordinances that govern these types of decisions. So yep. that is definitely, that has actually been studied at length. We're at the tail end of that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a matter of the decision makers pulling and the trigger. And who are the decision makers? Uh, I actually don't know the mechanism, but there's, I don't know if you've heard of Prop 218. Prop 218 ensure, it regulates how rates are determined and charged, yeah. and it has to be done in a fair manner. So whoever, whatever governing body oversees that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just these two, I think. We can take your question by you. We'll get everybody, but no, no new hands. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I was wondering if you've got an inventory of, of paved surfaces in the various watersheds and uh, and areas that can be, you know, like parking lots that are, you know, at different levels <coughs> of uh, convertibility to a permeable kind of surface. So that's all wrapped up in that comprehensive study not only in the rate aspect, but also in terms of project opportunities. So we've looked at a lot of those factors of owner, land ownership, land use, surface cover, and kind of, and also other data points. And like soil types, right. yeah, how well the water would soak in. Identify of different types of projects. So these are all these reports, mm -hmm. big reports that we've done. So that's, that's all wrapped, it's a very comprehensive <coughs> analysis, yeah. But it's a good point. Just a quick question. A couple of years ago, there was an extensive plan to um, divert a lot of water around McLaren Park through uh, Yosemite Marsh, mm -hmm. and there were culverts, and it looked like a very innovative plan mm -hmm. to pull stormwater from running down the street, but divert it into culverts mm -hmm. alongside sidewalks and green the areas, mm -hmm. and basically do what everybody's mm -hmm. been saying, greening the mm -hmm. areas, but in a really 
systemic way to create to stop flooding. Mm -hmm. How is that plan going? Is it still part of your overall plan? I believe it is. It's part of one of our eight pilot pro projects for green infrastructure. So we have eight watersheds throughout the city. For, yeah, watersheds throughout the city. And each of those eight watersheds, we implemented what we call like a basically a pilot project to test different types of green infrastructure because it is a relatively new type of approach and to gauge the performance <coughs> and the cost of maintenance associated with those. So as far as I'm not, I can find out exactly yeah, that, 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 any, that was part of I it. I haven't seen any work on it. It okay. seemed like it was going to start. Yeah, I know a number of um, the eight have, are in construction and okay. two, two of them are, one of them is complete. I don't remember. There, I can find out and okay. we can give an update. Mm -hmm. yeah. The last one. I think we all know how complex this project would be to actually solve the problem. And I appreciate your coming out with basically no news for us. I appreciate your doing that. But um, so engineering wise, it's an extremely difficult and expensive project. In your opinion, <coughs> what would it take politically to get this done? Um, I'm not a politician. But it is, I mean, it's, it is a complex issue, and I think that speaks to why it has taken this long. It, is, it involves multiple agencies, it involves multiple property, properties potentially, um, and it involves money, which is always a hot topic. I don't have an answer for how to best expedite that pro process, because that is not my, <laughs> I'm not a politician, that is not my expertise. Um, but those are just a lot of the things that are at play. So yes, it is, it is highly, aside from all the engineering, it's very complex. It's just the nature of it. But you know, I will say that um, the attention that we've put on this area has been a lot uh, as a response to people's outcry. You know, I will say that, you know, people coming to the commission meetings and talking to the supervisor and the mayor, that has an impact. Let's be honest. And so we are, you know, really devoted to looking at this area and coming up with some solutions because we heard from you. So it's always good to make your opinion known to the decision makers, you know, and uh, your supervisor and the mayor and, you know, make your voices heard as you've done. So. And we'll continue to do. The supervisors, that's another question. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's yeah, it, it, as we're saying, it's complicated. It's very, very expensive. And even the decision makers have to look at this in the context of other things. You talked about buying out the homes. Is that going to fly in a city where there's a huge housing crisis? You know, where the priorities might be to create more housing, not to get rid of some. So that's the decisions that these decision makers have to make. You know, it's trade-offs. So Buy them out and build houses on stilts. But <laughs> and I thought one more hand went up somewhere. Yeah. Well, yeah. Can I extend that question just a tiny yeah. bit? So state level, city level, we're sort of stymied, but then there's state, right, federal, and then we're in this quasi area, there's no official flood zone here, so the federal regs don't kick in. Would it behoove us to, you know, declare a state of emergency when their houses are flooded with sewage? I mean, would, would that's what I'm trying to get at with this idea of what politically could be done to uh, give some more teeth to this the solutions here. Um, I would say sewage flowing in people's houses is a state of emergency. So how could we get, we can't get city to deal with that, how can we get the state to pay attention? Or well, and people that? are paying what attention, regulatory see? bodies are paying attention, the EPA is paying attention. You know, we are regu heavily regulated. And so there are a lot of regulatory agencies that are we report to on a regular basis that are looking at what's happening in San Francisco. So that's another angle. And what are they saying? Is um, the city going to get fined a million? million dollars or ten million dollars because of these SSOs? I don't know. Okay. There's, there's oh. CSOs, but <laughs> in our system there's CSOs, which is actually, yeah. it's a combined, it's very different system from a regulatory standpoint. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well we'll have you back. I'm um, Angie, oh, we get her Nancy, question? did you want to? Well, I was just kind of tying into what Lisa was saying. I keep hearing the term decision maker, but who are they? I mean, this is this is kind of a gray area because we keep hearing that it has to go back to these people. So and we we're have asking, a, yeah. we're asking you, 
who they are, and you're telling us you're not sure. No, 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 we know who they are. The, the, the commission, we are the Public Utilities Commission. Right. We have commissioners. Right. They're appointed by the mayor. Right. So you have the mayor, you have the SFPUC commission. They have meetings every two weeks on Tuesday. You can go to the meetings. You can listen to all the things that they are presiding over. Um, you know, the Board of Supervisors has a stake in this. We have the rate, the rate fairness board reviews Excellent. all of our um, rate proposals. So there are a lot of different bodies that are looking at what we're doing and making decisions on it. Okay. So I'm sorry we don't have more news than we have, but we do want to keep coming out here and just letting you know how the wheels are turning slowly, but the wheels are turning. And uh, we're going to take your feedback and continue to go talk to other residents in San Francisco and get their feedback. and. Uh, Pass that along. But, but our having gone to the regional state water board apparently helped somebody. The squeaky wheel. You were referring to how we had been a squeaky wheel. I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> Did I well, not a squeaky wheel, but you said that that the fact that other agencies are involved in this. So, um, well, you know, the the thing I see is that presently the I don't like it when, I, I would prefer that the mayor appointed people to commissions and I'm willing to let him retain the power to appoint people to commissions without reference necessarily other than just getting them approved to the Board of Supervisors. I don't see that dividing up the decision making and having the Board of Supervisors appoint other people because I'd like to see something get done and the Board of Supervisors <coughs> is their own dog and pony show. And so I look at this and I'm thinking to myself, well, We've uh, been nice so far to Ed Lee. We haven't gone and told him what we thought of him. But that's the, that's the, this is the season to beat up Ed Lee these last couple of years. And so what I'm hearing is that uh, we just take our best shot because we're only going to get what we're going to get anyway, and we might as well yeah. get their attention. <laughs> so I want to thank you for suggesting, even if it was indirect and not in the same words, <coughs> that our having gone down to City Hall had gotten somebody's attention. Thank you. <coughs> okay, well thank you for having us. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.